And I'd like to introduce you or welcome you to an introduction to NCAR HBC Systems. Um, I'm Mia Trahan with the CISL Consulting Group. Uh, if you're interested in contacting me personally, you can pass me a message over at mtrahan at ucar.edu. And if not, then you can also pass us any messages or any questions you all have through our ticketing service at our documentation page over in the knowledge base. Okay? And just to give everyone like fair warning here, um, not fair warning, but like just give you any ref references in the future here. Um, the knowledge base contains all the information that we're going to be talking about today, right, and even more information. So I do recommend using this as a resource in the future. Um, it's a really nice page. So yeah, please check it out. And yeah. Okay. Anyhow, before we begin, I'd like to pull up the participant code of conduct here, right, just to point out a pledge, right, so UCAR and CAR is committed to providing a safe, productive, and work welcome, welcoming environment for all participants in any conference, workshop, field project, or project hosted or managed by UCAR, no matter what role they play in their background. Um, I'm not going to read the rest of this, but yeah, please read through this. Please make sure that you accept everything here, and please, like, be, be kind to everyone, right, because, you know, this is a really welcoming group. And, yeah, just wanted to point this out and make sure everybody is good to go here. Okay? Cool. All right, so welcome. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and staying through all that technical, uh, all the technical issues here. Um, before we begin, I just want to point out a couple things. First off, the tutorial is being recorded and will be available on the CISL website within the next few days if you want to check it out there. If you have any questions, please enter them in the chat. Um, Tasia over here is going to help me out with any questions that you guys have, and I'll answer them on the fly. So please feel free. I want this as interactive as possible. Um, yeah, it'd be really awesome if you could do that. Uh, next, if you could keep your computer audio and phone muted. I know that like sometimes it's challenging to miss this, but please double check. Because, yeah, it really does interrupt things, and we want to keep things moving as smoothly as possible. And lastly, please turn off your Zoom video. It saves bandwidth, and it's going to help it be a little bit more clear, right, in case you do have any network issues. Okay? Awesome. All right, so we have a ton of topics to go, go through today, so I'm going to try to get through as much of it as possible. Um, I will say that we might miss a few things, but here's a general outline of what we'll be covering. Um, first thing is going to be the NCAR HPC systems. Um, we'll be going over specifics of Cheyenne and Casper, as well as doing a quick introduction on Gust, uh, not Gust, Gust and Derecho. Um, next, we'll talk a little bit on the system account manager. We'll go into system access and how you can access the cluster yourself. Um, we'll talk about data, data storage spaces, so places you can store data, how you can transfer data, or how you can access shared uh, data that we host for you. We'll talk about the software environment. Um, we'll get into batch job submissions. And lastly, we'll try to cover a little bit on data analysis, but we're going to be really pressed for time here, so I'm going to just kind of briefly go over that. Okay? Cool. Now, any questions before we actually move in? Okay, awesome. All right, and feel free again, pass any questions. You can stop me where I am, right? I will get to it and we should be good to go. All right, first off, let's talk about HPC systems. So first off, I wanna point out this facility. So if you've been, so if you've been to Mesa Lab or if you've been here recently, you might be wondering like, where do we even store an HPC system in our facility? Well, we don't. Um, it's actually located in Wyoming. Um, this is the NCAR Wyoming Supercomputing Center. Um, we call it NWSC, right? And it's this large facility that houses all our HPC systems over here in this nice field. It's a really nice facility. I haven't actually been there myself, but really cool place. I think visitors are allowed. So yeah, super cool location. Um, and this is where all, like where you'll connect to and actually do your, uh, do your workflow here. Okay, just a few stats here on the NCAR Wyoming Supercomputing Center. Um, NCAR Data Center is located in Cheyenne, Wyoming, right? So hence the name Cheyenne for our cluster and Casper, Wyoming for our other cluster. Um, it entered service in about 2012 to accommodate NWSC-1 system, Yellowstone. 
um, and then it was upgraded into NWSC2 Cheyenne, right, which is the current system we have. That being said, we're not actually staying on Cheyenne forever. We are going to go ahead and move on to our next major supercomputing cluster in the summer of next year, right? So please look forward to that. I believe that one machine's going to be called The Raid Show, but we haven't, I want to say there's an official announcement on everything yet, but yeah, that's going to be coming up really soon, so please look forward to it. Okay, and just a few little tidbits here on the NWSC. Um, so it is a LEED Gold Certified Data Center. Um, it is a Green Data Center of the Year in 2013, right? So it's won many different awards here. Um, I'm just going to hop around here. 10% of electrical power from wind, right? So it's very eco-friendly. And yeah, it's extensive use of sustainable and recycled material in its construction. So you know that it's as environmentally friendly as possible to get your work done. Okay. Well, and here's a picture of it. It's got this nice Cheyenne written on it. And here's some stats on it. So again, it's the second supercomputer we've deployed. Um, Interproduction in 2012, so in January. And it debuted as number 21 of the world's top 500 supercomputers. And just for reference here, in 2001, four years after it was deployed, it was number 100, which is just nuts, right? So we've been, we've had a really powerful machine in here, right? And it's lasted us a really good long time. So in terms of the actual specs of the machine, there's about 4,032 compute nodes uh, going out about 145,000 cores. Uh, so it's a ton of different cores, and you can utilize a good chunk of them. Um, yeah, there's no limitation on the types of jobs that you request. Of course, if you request the entire system, then it's going to take a little bit of time to actually get to the queue, so I don't really recommend that. But that being said, it is technically possible. Um, and just some more stats in terms of the other specifications. It's a dual socket with 18 cores per socket. Um, it's 2.3 gigahertz Intel Xeon Broadwell processors. Uh, and it's going to be about 313 terabytes of total system memory. This is DDR4. So generally playing pretty fast, not up to like today's standards in terms of like your local machine. But that being said, all that memory and all those cores working together can compute some really good workloads. Lastly, I'll talk about our interconnect system. So this is the actual fabric that connects the nodes and makes it fast and lets the nodes actually talk to each other. Um, that's the Mellanox EDR InfiniBand. Right? And yeah. And lastly, I'll talk about our login nodes. So we have six login nodes for Cheyenne. They're dual socket and they have 18 cores. That being said, I don't really recommend running anything on this because we'll kill it because it's not very nice to have. All right, so be pretty generous about that. I'll get into that in a bit, but login nodes are not meant for computing. Okay? Cool. Um, lastly, we'll talk about the operating system. And actually, I'm just going to skirt through this, but yeah, there's, you know, uh, SUS Linux Enterprise System 12 SP4, and we use PPS as our batch scheduling system. So if you use Slurm, it's really similar to that. And if you use PPS, there's only really two that are popular. So yeah, those are, are that's basically the stats of Cheyenne. And just a few more tidbits here. Lastly, I'll talk about the planned lifetime of the system. So this system is going down in June 23, no, 2023. So again, at this year, when we're going to go ahead and move on to our next system here. Um, if you want more information on that, please check out our documentation because it has more information on our moving over to derecho. OK. All right, so the latest in terms of how this is going to go is going to be about December of 2023. So you'll have a little bit more time on Cheyenne. Okay. Cool. Next, let's talk about Casper, which is our visualization and high throughput computing cluster. Um, it's actually a bunch of different things, but um, it's a 100 heterogeneous compute nodes, so it's a little bit different than what Cheyenne is. That being said, these are all targeted towards a very specific kind of tasks that you would need in your workflows. So we have specialized kind of high throughput computing nodes, right? So if you just need tons and tons of throughput in terms of the amount of like cores that you need, right? And pass along as much as possible and divide it up and try to compute in that kind of capacity, then these are great nodes for that. Um, we also have two large memory nodes. 
uh, so not too many there, but they are 1.5 terabytes of system memory, so very useful resource. We have nine nodes for data analyst, anal, analysis sorry, and visualization. Um, these all include a NVIDIA Quattro GP100, right? So great visualization kind of resource there. Uh, 10 nodes feature large memory dense GPU configurations. So they have about four NVIDIA Tesla or eight NVIDIA Tesla. So there's two types. And lastly, there's four nodes that are reserved for research data archive workflows. Okay. Now, key thing with Casper is that when you are requesting kind of information on here, you're going to want to be really explicit in terms of what kind of node you want and what kind of resource you want in order to make sure you get the right node. Okay? Cool. Uh, lastly, again, it's using PBS. And notice that the operating system is actually different than Cheyenne. Um, that shouldn't have too many different kind of impacts on your workflows, but it is a little bit different. Okay, cool. All right, now, now that we've gone over that, we should probably talk about how you'll be interacting or managing a lot of your specific features and preferences that you want on the system. We use something called SAM, which is our system account manager. Um, I'll go ahead and pull it up here. But actually, I don't know if I have the time, so I'm gonna scooch back. <laughs> But yeah, essentially it looks like this, right? You have the options to change a few aspects of this thing. So if you want to change your shell or if you want to change your kind of primary group, then this is the place to do it. You can also manage like default kind of project, right? And your project's gonna be like how you access specific cores in the system. So there's lots of stuff like that, like lots of defaults that you'll be able to manage in this kind of specific uh, website. Okay. You can also do some information, you can also query some information about available projects and remaining balances. So if you want to check to see how many cores or how many core hours you have left on the system, this is a great place to do it. Okay. Cool. All right. So now that we've gotten through all the kind of tidbits here, let's go ahead and actually log into Cheyenne or Casper. We're going to do Cheyenne today. So if you want to follow along, feel free to do so. If you can't, then that's also okay. Don't, don't worry about that. But I'll go ahead and log us in and walk us through the process, okay? Okay, let me make this a little bit larger. I apologize, everybody. Okay, I think that's good to go. Um, but what we're going to do here is we're going to go ahead and use the SSH command to log into the system. So I'll run SSH, right? And then you want to put your username. So my username is mtrahan at... Uh, Cheyenne.ucar.edu, okay? And this should go ahead and log you into the machine. Now ask if you want to ensure that you're, it's basically doing some kind of uh, validation in terms of whether or not this is going to be the system you want to connect to. You want to say yes here. Okay, and then after that, it's gonna to say token response. From here, you're gonna to wanna to input your NCAR UCAR password. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Please note that there's not gonna be any text that's shown. This is a secure prompt here, right? So you're not gonna see any text actually appear when you type this in. So just make sure you're good with that. And lastly, you should get a prompt on your phone for a duo notification that once you access, then you'll be logged into the machine. Okay. Cool. Does anyone have any questions on that as I scooch back to the slides here? All right. Once we're actually on our login nodes here, then we'll either be placed on Shine or Casper, whichever one you specify. Um, of course, Casper, if you're logging to Casper, you just replace the word Cheyenne with Casper on the SSH prompt, right? And then from here, you'll be put on one of the six login nodes on Cheyenne or one of the two login nodes on Casper, whichever one you choose. Okay, and the host names for this are going to be Cheyenne 1 through 6 or Casper login 1 and 2. Okay. Cool. All right, and this just walks us through again if you want to make sure. Um, 
Yeah, you can also pass in X11 forwarding through SSH, but I won't talk too much about that today. Um, but yeah, you can add in additional flags if you want to pass that information along. And from here, you'll get your kind of message prompt. Cool. All right, so going back to that login node kind of thing I was talking about prior. Um, so oh, being part of it, oh, we do have a question. Um, oh, they deleted their question. Oh, okay. Um, it was, what is the minus Y flag on the slide for? Oh, that's a good question. Okay, so I kind of skirted around this, right? But what SSH is doing, or what these flags are specifically doing, right? Um, the one is dash Y, that's a X11 forwarding prompt, right? I believe it's specifically a bypass for additional kind of security, but it's the same as dash X if you use that, but all it's doing is it allows your machine to actually forward X11 communication, right? Which would essentially create a little window on your screen of whatever application you wanna run if you wanna do an interactive job. Okay, so. Essentially, if you want to have like a nice display attached to this, then you could do that. Um, this machine isn't actually equipped for it yet, so I do apologize for that. I can't really showcase it today. But yeah, that's essentially what it's for. Great question though, thank you. Okay. So back to my topic here on good citizenship, right? So login nodes are shared. Right, so when you log into a node, you're sharing that node with whoever else needs to use the system, right? And if you run any kind of computationally intense process on the login node, then it's gonna really slow down their kind of workflows and their kind of situations, right? Because of that, we really, really want people not to be running anything on login nodes that aren't really, really kind of small tasks. Okay, so being a good citizen really just means Limit your usage on the login node to reading and writing text code, compiling smaller applications, right? So no like enormous compilations or anything, right? Just kind of small like 10 minute kind of compilations or something, right? From performing data transfers, right? So if you need to move data on the system and interacting with the job scheduler, okay? So really just these four tasks, right? Anything else should be done on a compute node or an interactive job, okay? Cool. Lastly, um, please don't try to run any sudo kind of commands on the system. Um, so the system's shared, right? So you're not gonna have admin privileges like you would on your local machine. So a lot of the sudo stuff won't really work, right? You'll probably come across like a message saying, oh yeah, this is not working, right? You don't have privileges. So yeah, please don't try because it's just gonna cause you a little bit of confusion. Okay? Okay, awesome. All right, and lastly, if you do need any questions, so if you have any questions or any issues, right, this is a link to our help desk here. Um, it's gonna be rchelp at ucar.edu. I'll go ahead and click it. Um, really nice resource. You can pass us along any question that you have here, right, and then that should be good to go because they'll be forwarded to us, and then we'll get back to you within about an hour of your question, um, within kind of reason in terms of our hours, which are eight to five, okay? Cool. Okay, cool. Now that we've talked about that, um, first off, I kind of just want to give us a little bit of a tour before I go over the details of what's going on here, right? So these are our four directories, and I'm going to go ahead and just pass us along, right, and show us just what we're, what everything is located at, okay? Cool. So the three primary ones you're going to get just right off the bat are going to be your home directory, your work directory, in your scratch directory. Okay, so your home directory is where you're gonna start off on the machine. So when you log on to the machine, you're gonna be passed to your home directory. And if I go ahead and type PWD, you'll see that your home directory is in Glade, U, home, and then whatever your username is. Okay. Next, we're gonna go to our work directory. Okay, so our work directory is gonna be located in a similar location except prefixed by the word uh, work and without the U. So it's gonna look like this, Glade, or sorry, slash Glade, slash work, slash M Trahan. Okay, and that'll go ahead and throw us in our work directory. This is gonna be a little bit larger space to actually do kind of compiled applications, things like that, right? So store that kind of information here, 
I'll go over the specifics in just a second. And lastly, let's go to our scratch directory here. Okay, so this one is also in a really similar place. It's gonna be slash glade, slash scratch, slash mtrahan. Okay, and there's our scratch space. So three really easy to access locations here. Um, yeah, that each kind of serve their purpose along with an additional one that you'll get with your project. Okay, so just to go over again what we've went through, right? These are the quotas actually associated with what we have on Glade. And so on your home directory, you don't have too much space. It's only about 50 gigabytes, right? You use this space primarily for settings, any kind of scripts that are really important, um, code, right? So if you have any kind of compiled code that you're working on, keep it in here, right? This place is backed up. I don't remember how, how often, but it's backed up. Um, yeah, so this is a great place to be storing that information. Next we have work, right? This is primarily gonna be designed for more models or anything that you compile. So any kind of user application, any kind of model that you compile or any kind of compiled codes that you're gonna to have to run, right, keep it in here. Now note that this place is not backed up, okay? So you wanna be careful not to store anything super important here because if anything kind of breaks, then you won't have the information saved. Okay, now that being said, right, it is a pretty large space, so it's a little bit challenging to do the backup. So yeah, keep your expectations a little bit in check there because it's a little bit challenging. All right, lastly, we have Scratch, and the quota here is a little bit misleading, right? So our Scratch space is gonna be our fast directory. This is gonna be the one with the most access, the fastest access, and it's the place where you wanna keep all your data sets or things like that to run your applications. Okay, so these are where your run directories go, this is where your temp output goes, right? And then once your output actually comes out in this directory, you're gonna wanna move that to a secure location once it's done. Okay, this place is gonna be 10 terabytes, so it's much larger than anything. All right, that being said, it's purged, right? Meaning your data is gonna go away after 120 days if you don't move it off the system. Not the system, sorry, but out of that directory. So you're gonna wanna go ahead and make sure that everything that you have that's important, you put it in, pull it out, make sure it's not sitting in there, right? And always keep a copy, okay? Cool, now this quota can actually be expanded if you do need the assistance there. Um, yeah, you just pass us along a case or a ticket, right? We will go ahead and communicate with you how much you need, right, the reasons why you need it. And once we have that information, we'll go ahead and expand or contract your quota based on whatever you need. And then from there, you know, you'll have that quota until whichever date you request, okay? Cool. Lastly, we have a project space allocation. Um, this one's gonna be for your project or general kind of project, right? Essentially, you'll do this in your allocation kind of request here, right? But this is essentially gonna be your location where you keep like any kind of shared information, right? Between any project mates or you know, just kind of generalized kind of codes that are going to be, you know, stored for that kind of location. That being said, this place is also not backed up and there is no default quota. You will figure that out inside your allocation request. Okay? Cool. Um, yeah, lastly, let's go ahead and check out all these kind of storage options with the command Glade quota. All right, so I'll go ahead and run Glade quota and quota here. And you can see that all the information that we have or just talked about, you can see that's all listed out here in this nice printout, right? You can see that my scratch has about 400 gigabytes used in it. Um, our work is also using about 123 gigs and we keep our home spaces a little bit lean, okay? So yeah, this just give you, gives you a rundown of how full your system is, right? And your overall quota and targets. So yeah, feel free to check it out and feel free to run it. And if you have any questions, feel free to pass them along, pass, pass them to us. Okay. And I know I ran through a bunch of stuff. Do we have any questions or anyone in the chat? Okay, awesome. So this is gonna go ahead. So next thing we'll talk about here, right? And I just realized that I kind of skipped ahead. This is our like, quota side, but. I'm gonna go ahead and move into snapshots next.
right? So on our home directory, we actually have snapshots associated with, you know, backups. So if you ever accidentally delete something really important in your home directory, you can actually pull it out inside this really, really hidden directory called dot snapshots. Now, if I go ahead and navigate home, right? So I'm going to do CD tilde, right? And actually type LS dash LA. You'll notice that we actually don't have a dot snapshots directory like inside this list, right? That's because this place is like turbo hidden, like it's really hidden, right? You can still access it inside your home directory. Oops, I'm actually saying snapshot, sorry. Oh, did I do it wrong? Oh, sorry, yeah, I did it backwards. So actually, we'll do this, so. Okay, so it's gonna be actually located inside home and then you'll check cd.snapshots. And then in here, you'll see all the different listings for different days, right? And each of these days goes ahead and correlates with whatever kind of snapshot or whatever data is stored in it, right? So if we go ahead and pick, let's just say, um, this directory right here. Then we can go ahead and just go to M. Traham. And you'll see this is all the information I had backed up at that location. Okay. Cool. So not in your home directory. It's like one level up, right? Dot snapshots and then navigate to whichever day you want to check, right? And then navigate to your directory. Okay. Oh yeah, that's a really cool and useful utility. So we have another utility here, right? I wasn't actually aware of this because I started like a couple months ago, but um, yeah, it's called Snap LS, right? This lists all the snapshots available. Um, so yeah, if you want to do this as well, this is a really good way to do it. Don't navigate yourself, right? Just run Snap LS inside your home directory. It'll list out all the different snapshots you have available, right? And then you can go ahead and just like copy which one you want and then be good to go. Okay, cool. And then this Glade Quota, we went over that. Lastly, let's talk about campaign storage. So if you may like, you may guess that like project allocations sometimes don't really align that well with the overall spin time span it takes to get things published, right? This kind of stinks, right, for obvious reasons because you know, you might have issues like down the line. So we have a solution for that, right? And this is called campaign storage, right? Essentially, you throw your data on here, right? And we retain it for much longer than our normal kind of like instances of quotas. So, you know, in your project kind of quota, right? You're not going to be able to store things for super long. It's only going to last as long as your project. But in your campaign storage, this is going to last pretty much indefinitely until we need to actually remove data from it. And so, yeah, this is a really good place to keep your information, right, if you need to do a publication with your data, right? Um, yeah, you do need to do a request for this, though. So you'll be able to set that up inside your allocation request, right? And then from here, um, you can go ahead and access it, not on Cheyenne, but you can do it through either Globus, Casper nodes, or data access nodes, right, in these specific directories, or through Globus uh, NCAR campaign storage. Okay, and I'd love to go through Globus, but I realize we're like already 20 minutes before and I haven't even got the jobs yet, so we're gonna go ahead and start scooching over. <laughs> All right, last thing that I will talk about on storage here. Well, let's talk about collections. So well, let's just say that, you know, you know someone in a different lab that uses the exact same data and the exact same kind of, you know, information. Right, well, it's likely that sometimes we'll actually keep a lot of the stuff kind of compressed in its own location here, right? So the two that we have for curated data sets, right, are RDA and CMIP6. RDA stands for Research Data Archive. This is essentially UCAR's kind of, you know, archive here in terms of whatever kind of information that we have, right? You can pull through any kind of data that you want from Glade Collections slash RDA. 
Okay. CMIPS. And CMIPS 6 is a bit more expansive here. So this is a collaboration between many, many different institutions, right? And this is all the data that we're storing for people to use and access from here, right? Um, complicated process in terms of getting that data, right? But you can request for us to pull it for, us, for you, right? And we'll keep it within our kind of collections here, right, for you to access and use with any kind of partners that you need. And there's links here if you want to check out either um, rda.ucar.edu. Here's our data archive here. And here's CMIP. A little bit more extensive kind of explanation. And I don't know about CMIP 5, but I'm sure that you can probably get CMIP 5 as well. Okay. Cool. Actually, I messed up one thing. That was last month's storages. Let's talk about data transfers next. Okay, so data transfers are a bit, well, they're really simple because there's only really three options in terms of what you want to do here, right? So for short, small transfers, if you haven't used SCP or rsync before, it is extremely easy. It's just like SSH, except you just pass along a file with that SSH, right? This is really, really, really good if you need to move like, you know, kilobytes, megabytes, nothing really enormous, right? So I do recommend that for the small kind of transfers that you might need in your everyday. Okay, if you're using Windows, you can also use a lot of Windows utilities, right? I think it's like S Win SCP or something, right? That's a nice utility in terms of actually doing the transfers, right, with a nice GUI. So I do recommend taking a look at those just for quick transfers. That being said, if you need to transfer anything larger than like, say, a couple gigabytes, I really recommend doing Globus instead. Um, Globus is really, really cool a resource. I know I like touched on it previously, but I haven't really started talking about how cool this kind of transfer system is, primarily because if your transfer kind of stops in any sort of way, say you go out to lunch and you close your computer, right, it'll actually retain the location where you start continuing your transfer, right, and you won't need to worry about small details like that. Right, Globus is a really sophisticated transfer uh, utility that we have installed in the system, right? As a nice GUI that you can access through any browser, right? And all you really need is a Globus endpoint to wherever your uh, store, wherever your data is. So yeah, it's a really cool resource. Um, I do recommend this for anything larger than, say, a gigabyte or two. Okay. And the two locations you can actually transfer here to are NCAR Glade or NCAR Campaign Storage, of course, right? These are the endpoints that we host publicly. So you'd connect to one of those inside Globus's uh, nice GUI here. And then, yeah, you can go ahead and access and pass along any data that you need. Okay. Next, let's go into something else on a completely different topic. Let's talk about software. All right. And so, CISL provides a wide range of software tools inside the HPC environment, right? And we're going to go over like and look at all this stuff on the terminal in a few minutes. But just a brief, oh, sorry, just a brief overview here. Um, yeah, we have a bunch of compilers here: Intel, GNU, PGI. Well, it's no longer PGI, I don't think. I think it's a uh, the NBC compiler now. Um, we don't, I don't think we have Clang yet, though, but I think Clang is becoming pretty popular, so we'll probably start hosting that as well at some point in the future. Um, we have ARM Forge debuggers and performance tools like DDT and MAP. We have MPI libraries. Uh, if you used MPT, that is a specific, uh, I forget. I think it was like. Message yeah, it's, it, it's hosted by, I believe, who was? HPE. Yeah, HPE. Yeah. Yeah, so HBA hosts that, right? Um, it's a specific kind of thing to our system, right? But it's a really nice utility. It makes things super simple, right? Recommend that one big time. Uh, Intel MPI, Intel MPI is very performant. I recommend that as well. And Open MPI can be sometimes a pain in the butt, but it pretty much works whenever the other, these other two don't. So yeah, three really good resources for MPI libraries. Um, IO libraries, we have NetCDF. PNET CDF and HDF5, right? So if you need to do kind of large scale IO and parallel levels, these are your libraries to do it. Um, analysis languages. So Python is really, really big and always picking up, 
right? We have specific utilities built in for Python, like Conda and things like that, right? So if you need to build your own kind of software stacks with Conda, you can do that on our machine. We also have Julia, R, IDL, and MATLAB, right? So a ton of different resources for analysis. Some convenience tools like NCAR compilers, which is really nice. Um, we'll get into that in a bit. And like GNU Parallel and R clone. So yeah, tons of different resources for you to utilize. And we'll go ahead and actually take a look at them right now. So I'll go ahead and show us all our module system that actually access this. So our software isn't all loaded by default. Instead, we use something called, I believe we use LMOD, or yeah, we use LMOD as our environment module system. Right, and this actually kind of compacts all of our resources into a nice kind of consumable way. So if I type module, Avail, right? This is going to list out all the different software we have in a nice kind of formatted system. So if we take a look, we have a ton of different software on here, right? You'll see that there's compilers, um, some independent software, um, specific things to Intel 19.101, right? So this stuff, this list actually will expand and contract based on whatever compilers and MPIs you actually utilize, right? So it will change as you need it. That being said, it's a great resource in terms of like showcasing all the different types of softwares that we have, right? As well as just selecting and choosing things. Okay. So we have a bunch of different D's and L's here, right? This is kind of confusing. Um, so L stands for any module that's currently loaded. So if you see that we didn't actually load any modules prior, right? By default, we have Intel 19.1.1 loaded, as well as MPT. NCAR compilers, and NetCDF. Okay. So yeah, those are default modules that you'll get right when you log in. And not default modules, sorry, are automatically loaded modules right when you log in. Next thing is all of our default modules, right? These are the ones with the little Ds, right? As you can see, we try to aim for the latest version. If there's stability issues, right, then we'll go ahead and make sure that's not really there yet. But yeah, we'll go ahead and update these occasionally, like, I think it's like every half year or something, right, in order to get everybody the latest software that they can use. Okay. Cool. Um, about our modules again. And here's all the module commands that you have. And if you are lazy like me, you will quickly learn there's a shortcut to all these commands. So I'm not going to lie, typing module killed me a little bit. So instead, we're going to type ML. Right, ML is shorthand for module, right, or module load specifically, but you can actually like type module, ML, like whatever software you want. So if I said I want a different Intel compiler, right, do ML Intel, right, and that would automatically load things. That being said, this can be paired with a lot of different uh, kind of utilities here, right, so I could do ML avail, right, and this would work exactly the same as how we type the big word module. Okay, so nice handy shortcut in case you need it. Anyhow, these are the different module commands that we have available. Um, we have module list, right? So it lists all the currently loaded modules. So if you don't want to look and see all those different L's inside of L, this is a good way to get a compressed list of that. Um, we have, of course, module avail, which just shows all modules currently available. Um, we have module load and unload, right? This will go ahead and load whatever software you need. Module swap, this will swap specific modules with any other different type of versions that you might need. Module purge, that will delete all, not delete, sorry, remove all the modules that you have currently loaded in the environment. And then a lot, the probably the coolest one that I didn't really take a look at before, module save and module restore. You can actually assign free kind of loaded collections of whatever modules you need for your workflows, right? And whatever kind of module name that you want to set. Right, so say that you had a specific workflow that required like a Conda environment um, and like a specific Intel compiler and a specific MPI and a specific FFTW, right? So you can actually save that under whatever your workflow name is, right? By saying doing module save workflow, right? And then that would save that as that workflow and then you can do module restore workflow and then reload all those modules back into your environment. Lastly, this one's kind of a pain in the butt, but it's useful. Um, module spider. This is essentially the search command of the module kind of world. 
So let's just say that I wanted a specific FTW. Let's say module spider FFTW. All right, this is going to go ahead and start pulling out all the specific versions that we have of FTW, right? As well as any dependencies that we could use for it. All right, so this is kind of a pain to write sometimes because we need to do this kind of complicated notation here, or better yet, this is the way I kind of like doing a specific kind of information regarding whatever module I want. All right, so it's always good to put your version name at the end of this. But we'll do 3.3.9 here, right? And this is going to load or give you all the details that you, you'll have, right? Including like whatever kind of dependencies that you need to actually load this module, as well as just some help docs or any kind of information you'll need. Okay. Cool. Really helpful utility. Um, if you're very confused about our module system, this is the place to go to figure out if we have that software available for you already. Okay. Cool. Um, I don't know. There's any questions? <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, sorry if I can't answer any questions. Uh, yeah, Tasia's going to give you back in just a few minutes, right? So if there's any questions in chat, then we'll get to it just as soon as we can. Okay. Cool. And here's just another example module avail. And last of that information. Okay. Oh, lastly, I will showcase this in action. We'll go ahead and just do which ICC, right? So ICC is, ICC is the Intel C compiler, right? We're going to go ahead and showcase this in action here, right? By running this, this will actually point out wherever the ICC applications installed in our system here, right? So this is located in car compilers, 1.19.1, uh, and there it is. You can see it right there. All right, so if I go ahead and load a different module here, so say module load, so I do module swap Intel, and we will do, um, actually, I don't know which ones we have available. So we have, mm, we'll do 2022.1, or yeah, 2022.1. So we'll just go ahead and do, oops. Okay, this is freaking out on me. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm not super sure what's going on here. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Something just got mangled in my terminal. Um, we're good to go here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and do module swap. And, and we'll do intel slash 2022.1. Oh, 1.2. And we'll just go ahead and swap in that module. Uh, I think I actually did it backwards. There we go. So Intel 2022.1. And you can see that it goes ahead and swaps that version. And if I go ahead and do which ICC, you can see that that has shifted from our original path, which was 19.1. Okay. So yeah, it's a really nice, useful utility. It will dynamically load all this stuff for you, right? And that's what our software stack looks in action. All right. Um, this is more stuff, right, showing more kind of information with that CDF if you want to see more examples here. In this example, it goes ahead and showcases pretty much what I just talked about, right, and reloaded that version with until 2022, right, as well as another one, right, which is just showcasing that CDF, right, and showing, showcasing the different types of lists or whatever modules are actually loaded in the environment. Okay. All right. That's cool and dandy. Um, you're probably thinking, all right, it's kind of a pain in the butt to actually, you know, make sure all this stuff is good to go every single time I log into the system. I'll just throw it in my bash RC or profile or, you know, TCH RC, right? Please don't do that. <laughs> um, I know it's a little bit of a pain to actually type out that command every time you load into the system, right? 
But the reason why this kind of matters is because if there's any, any if there's any issues with your module environment, for the first off, it actually makes your login process a lot longer, right? And will put load on the system right as you log in, right? Not very ideal, but not really the primary reason, why, at least why I really care about this. Um, I've had users that had their environments kind of bricked by having this module stuff inside of their profiles or kind of in basic setup scripts, right? So when they have it in there and something goes really awry with the module stack, right, you might come across a, a situation where you're actually not able to log into the system or it won't prompt you properly and you'll have a very kind of weird error in terms of your login process, right? So you don't want to have that. You might have errors along the way. Um, it can cause a lot of different issues with your environment. So please keep this module stuff out of your bash RC or TCHRC. OK? That being said, we do have an alternative. Um, that module save and that module restore command, that is what we recommend you do instead. Right? It's really useful and it will save you a lot of time. Um, you just need to remember whatever you name your modules, right? Because that will go ahead and do that dynamic loading for you. OK? Cool. And Tasia, is there any questions or are you good? Yeah, if yeah, you do have any questions, um, Slido is again below the screen, so scooch all the way down and then make sure to pass any questions if you do have any for us, right? I know it's a little bit, you know, but if you do have any questions, we, we do appreciate the interaction. Okay, cool. Um, this got, gets us to our pretty much last topic here. We don't have too much more time, and that's running jobs. Um, so running t tasks on batch jobs here. So generally speaking, most tasks are too resource intensive to run on login nodes. So it's best to utilize our resource management system, right, called PBS, to go ahead and schedule and book a lot of that information, right? So what you're doing with a batch job, I like to envision this kind of like making a batch of cookies, right? You have like a batch, a platter of like pre-assigned kind of cook stuff, right? So a bunch of different cookies like pre-assigned, right? You put it in the oven, right? You step away for a while, right? It goes ahead and processes those cookies, right? And then you come in, pull them out, right? And then they're they're done. You have your your cookie data thing. Um, yeah, it's essentially that same process, right? So what you're doing with batch scheduling is you just push your kind of preloaded workflow into the super and supercomputing oven, right? And it'll bake your data cookies, and you'll pull them out, right? And you'll have a good, you know, resource there. So yeah, that's how I like to describe it, right? It's honestly a little bit foreign because most of the time when you're running things on your computer, you just kind of run it, right? So yeah, please note that it is a little bit different in that kind of capacity. OK. So when you do do these batch jobs, right, you're going to have to go ahead and request a specific number of compute tasks, nodes, and wall time to actually compute. Um, Jobs use core hours, which we charge against your selected project or account. So when you do your allocation request, then that will be your like account or how many core hours you'll have, and it'll be charged against that. And you can go ahead and check that in the SAM. Okay. Temporary files are often written by programs, and it's usually done through an environment variable called tempter. Um, it's always, always, always good to set a tempter in your scratch space before your job runs. Right, not before, but inside your job script before you actually run anything computationally intensive, right, to ensure, to ensure you avoid any job failures. Okay? Cool. And we're, going to, we're just going to go ahead and run through a few job scripts here, and I'll submit one for us. Okay? So here's the job script here. You can see we're going to break this down into as many topics, and I realize that's 2 o'clock already. If you need to take off, um, I do ask if you stay for like two minutes, I'll go through like the flags here and then you can take off because everything else is kind of like extra after that. But yeah, just wanted to let everybody know. Okay. So the first thing in your batch script is going to be your shebang statement. This is shell bang, a very dumb joke here. But this is essentially requesting whichever kind of shell you want to process these kind of commands here, right? So in this situation, we're using bash. Right? If you use TCH, you'll also do slash bin slash TCH. Okay? From here, we have a bunch of PBS directives. 
right? These are going to be essentially the flags you're going to pass to PBS, right? Detailing what type of job you want to have. So dash N stands for the name of the job, right? This is going to be included inside all of our kind of accounting systems, right? So if you want to check on this job, you want to go ahead and give it a good name. Okay. Next we have dash O, which is our output, right? So your output file is essentially whatever kind of logging information or any kind of like a standard out that you're going to have, right? This is going to be passed along to pbsjob.log, right? But you can set this to be whatever kind of log name you want. So you can pass this as like hello.log or whatever, okay? And that's your output. Now you also have an error flag, right? But that's not important in this context because we're actually going to conjoin error and output into a single stream, okay? Um, I'm just going to skip the A. Uh, we'll get to that in a few seconds. But how we actually combine our error and output is with these two flags, so these are kind of important. Dash J, O, E, and dash K, E, O, D. These essentially just ensure that your output is being redirected into a single file. And from there, it will make sure that it's also being outputted. The dash K is actually like keep or something. and it's essentially going to make sure that your file is actually being kept instead of just being tossed out. Okay, so you want to have both of these flags in there. Okay, I'll go back to A here, right? Dash A is going to be your project, right, or account, um, or allocations, like the way I like to think about it, right? So whatever your allocation ID, right, or project code is going to be, you're going to go ahead and put that in there, right? And then that's going to be where it gets charged against. Okay. Lastly, we have dash Q that stands for the quality of service, right? This can vary from resource to resource. In this situation, it's regular, right? But I do recommend taking a look at Cheyenne and Casper's documentation to make sure you set the right Q. And lastly, we have wall time here, right? This is how long your job's going to run specifically, right? So after five minutes, your job's going to die no matter what. Right, so you want to be really careful and always give yourself, I like to give myself always maybe 10, 20% based on whatever I kind of approximate. Okay, lastly, the very last flag that I'm going to go over here is going to be this select CPU long thing. Right, all this is is going to be the resources that you want to request per job. Right, so select, so I like to break this down into different components, right, so this select keyword right here. This stands for how many nodes you want. So I want two nodes, select two nodes, right, two groupings. Okay, then we do a colon, and then we specify how many different CPUs we want. All right, from there, we go, and CPUs really just meaning threads, right, so how many specific cores you want for your process. Then we have MPI procs, right? So if you want to use MPI, then you want to specify how many MPI procs you have. So in this situation, we have 36 tying to the 36 CPUs. Um, if we only wanted one, like one job or one task, right, using OpenMP instead, we'd switch the 36 with OMP threads, and then that'd be good to go. But yeah, these two are kind of optional. I do recommend setting them, though. It'll get you in the habit of actually requesting and knowing how, what kind of resources that you want. Okay, cool. And yeah, the rest is essentially just uh, commands that you want to run in your job, right? So these are predefined kind of commands listed out here, right? So export tempter, if you remember, this is to create our temp directory and redirect it to Scratch. Load some modules, right? So if you want to load any software, you do it inside the script, right? Because it doesn't share over from the login node. You want to make sure that you want to do it inside the job to make sure it's good to go. All right? And then lastly, we have a, I, I don't really do this, but if you want to interrogate the environment and pull out any information, you can do it here. And whatever application you want to run. So this is using a dummy script, hello world. Okay. Cool. And lastly, here's some commands you want to run. Um, QSub is actually how you do the submission, right? So you just do cut QSub, whatever the script is, and then you can check it with QStat. And we'll run this in a few seconds here. If you want to stay, if you don't, feel free to take off. Yeah. But yeah, um, I'll just go ahead and do a quick demo, and then we'll end it there, okay? So 
quick demo here is going to be inside my directory here. We're going to navigate to my trainings folder. And we have a script in here called examplejob.sh, right? So this is going to be a bash script. I'm going to go ahead and remove test that out here. So if we go ahead and cat example job script, you can see that we use the account that we have access to. You guys don't have access to this, so use your own account, please. Um, as well as the name, which is going to be test job. We have our output file be test.out. Um, you can also name this test.log, whatever you want. Um, the suffix doesn't matter. Um, then we have our wall time being five minutes here, right? So after five minutes, the job's going to die. Then we're going to select one node with two cores. And we just care about having one MPI process, but we're going to use OpenMP to actually parallelize this with two threads. OK. And we're going to request eight gigabytes of memory. And then there's that OE, OED, two flags in there that we're throwing in here just to make sure our standard out is conjoined together with air. And then lastly, we're going to request the regular queue. OK. And then from here, we just have some commands here, setting a temporary directory. We have our module load and module list command. And we have some echo commands here, printing out the host name and saying job complete. OK. Well, I'm actually going to, uh, I'm pretty sure this one doesn't work. I didn't set this on up correctly, but um, we're just going to run this right now because we're out of time. So QSOB, example job SH, right? This will go ahead and submit it. And we're just going to do QSTAT right away. Dash M tray, L dash U M tray hand. And we can see that our job is now running, right? With our required time all listed here. Right? So dash U stands for whatever user you want to select, right? You can go ahead and select your own user and check to see what jobs you have up running, right? Or instead, you can actually just do QSTAP with whatever job ID that you have, right? So we can request just this job ID instead. And that will also print out that information. Um, actually, I think it's dash J. Dash J, sorry. Oh, yeah, it's gone. Never mind. <laughs> You're absolutely right. But yeah, that's essentially how you run jobs. If I go ahead and check test.out here, you can see that here's our information, right? We have our environment parsing here, right? We loaded some modules. And lastly, we have job is running on the node R3, I0, N35. And last, we get a printout of job complete. Okay. Cool. Um, that's all the time I have. Uh, I do appreciate everybody sitting with me today. I know it's been problematic in terms of uh, the troubleshooting and things like that. Um, yeah, thank you all so much for sitting with me today. And yeah, I hope to speak with you soon. If you have any questions, please pass them along to our help desk. Um, I'm actually going to go back to the slides here and go to the very end. Yeah, here it is. But yeah, the full slides are going to be up on our documentation page as well as the video. Um, yeah, feel free to take a look. And if you have any questions, feel free to pass it along to CISL Help Desk. We'd love to meet you. Um, and if you want any other tutorials, feel free to check out our HPC's tutorials. There's a ton of stuff that are, that's getting covered much more in depth than what we have today. OK? All right, awesome. Any last questions before we exit? Oh, yeah. Yeah, good point. Um, I'll go over one last thing. So, yeah, a lot of people have interest in using Jupyter Hub at the moment. We actually host our own Jupyter Hub server, right? You can access it at jupyterhpc at ucar.edu, right? And from here, you can just go ahead and log in, right? So, I'll go ahead and do that. Okay. I will get a dual prompt here. And you can see this is where we can spin up our server. You can go ahead and press start here, right? And this will go ahead and start up a server, right? And you can select whatever resource you want. So, um, so Casper login is usually super busy. Cheyenne login, kind of not recommended. Um, I think Cheyenne PBS batch is probably the best kind of option, but you might be waiting in queue. 
So either of these two Casper options, and then Cheyenne's really there for non-visualization tasks, right? So just if you have like a raw kind of compute you need to do in Python, you can use these. So we'll use we'll use a Casper login here and see if we can get in. And here we go. And you'll see it loads in. And you can see all those kind of directories I had in my home directory are listed here. You can access all of your files. You can create kind of Jupyter notebooks. And you can actually create specific uh, Jupyter kernels as well if you want to have specific software tied to that. Um, I don't, I'm not going to go over that today, but if you want any other information, feel free to pass us along a case and happy to give it to you. Okay. Cool. That's pretty much it, though. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming, and yeah, chat with you soon.